where two or three are gathered in his name, he's in the midst. So let's welcome him again today as we sing. talking about it's to sign up to cook food and help with the Christmas Eve meals Christmas Eve morning and so make sure everybody sees it and um, while Mary Alice is headed this way I will remind everybody tonight we have our family Christmas program the children will be putting on a play and singing and We'll have other groups of people singing. And Nicole and the children's ministry will be taking up a love offering. The money is because the children will be getting angel trees for the nursing home, angel tree people recipients from the nursing home. And that money will go to purchase the gifts for the angel trees from the nursing home. If there's any leftover, because you know you can only spend so much, but if there's any leftover, it will go to supplement the children's ministry and some of the expenses they've had. So... On that note, oh, and good news, if you didn't look, we're at like 63 plus, almost 64,000 on our building fund for the roof and the basement. So that's exciting. So keep up the good work. So as I said last week, we have the Christmas bags that are in the CLC on the little table. If you walk in there, they're literally right on the right-hand side. They have the different staff members. Um, names on there so if you want to give something to staff members for Christmas that's where you put it um, it'd be really nice just to let them to for us to show them our appreciation because they do so much um, you know and some of the people are kind of on the forefront but then like for example Deanna she does so much and a lot of people don't see it but she is working all the time um, and everybody else does as well so if you could just Give them a little something, and if you want to, put it in the bag. If you're going to make a checkout, please make it to the person directly um, and not to the church. Thank you so much. Um, so, on that note, welcome. I'm glad you're here today. Um, we're going to begin our time in a minute with the call to confession and the prayer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you sit through that, and then when, because Jennifer's fixing to make you stand up and sing, um, but I hope everybody is staying warm and dry in this weird weather and that you're having fun shopping in this and I'm looking for a personal shopper because I have done zero so if anybody would like to shop for me not for me but for my people for me let me know um, but anyway on that note will you join me this morning in our call to confession this morning let us take this opportunity to slow down We reflect on the decisions that we've made this past week. Without fail, God wiggles God's self into the cracks of our lives, and we are made better for it. So let us worship with that confidence. And pray with me, please. God of mercy, a million times a day, we have the opportunity to be gracious, to assume the best in others, and to give the benefit of the doubt. A million times a day, we could choose the better way, but so often we don't. Fear and greed kick in. 
Assumptions and insecurities take the wheel. Comparison and critique lead the charge. Forgive us for forgetting that we are descendants of Joseph. Forgive us for forgetting that grace and mercy are in our blood. Forgive us for forgetting that all belong to you. Give us the courage to love even bigger than before and the wisdom to choose a better way. Amen. And I'm going to ask you to allow me a moment to pray and um, we'll go into the Lord's Prayer. So bow your heads, please. And I'm going to give us a minute of, not a whole minute, but some time of silence to give that room to breathe before we pray. God of mercy and grace, God of love and strength, God of power and might, we come to you today to worship your holy name, to continue on our journey of Advent as we reach the day we have celebrate the birth of Christ. And then we continue on as we wait for the return of Christ in our midst. Guide us and lead us today in worship. Let our hearts be solely set on this time and not our million things to do on our list, not the things that will be coming up today or tomorrow or through the week, but that for this time we just focus on you, God, through our relationship with Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we're a body and bodies have one voice. So let us now use that one voice to pray the prayer that Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now if our family will come forward and do the candle lighting, please. Quasi-family. Quasi-family. Oh, we got a Blake, too. He's family, too. All right. Over 100 people from the ages of 2 to 80 years old were asked the question, What brings you joy? From the voices of different generations, hear their answers. A clean kitchen... Sand between my toes. Being outside. Sleeping in my own bed after a night away. Having a camera in my hands. My partner's laugh. Mountain air. When my parents pick me up. The end of my to-do list. Hugs from my niece and nephew. Baby giggles. My cat. Putting my hands in the garden. A cord resolved. Stargazing. Bedtime books. A warm cup of coffee with friends. My new granddaughter. Lingering at the table after dinner. Time with family. Today we light the candle of joy. May its light remind us of all the good news this season bring. May, it light, may its light remind us of the many sources of joy in our lives. And may that joy not only draw us closer to one another, but closer to God. Family of faith, what brings you joy? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Would you please stand as we sing away in a manger? <clears throat> Oh, 
something as my wee little ushers come forward. I'm going to ask everyone to, except for my four that are taking up offering, I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes. And what I need you to do with your eyes closed is I need you to think of something this week that God brought to you or that God showed you, revealed to you, or something you were able to do this week, and you give the credit to God. I need you to do that today. We need to take a minute, more than a minute, every day, to be reminded that everything we have and everything we do is due to the gratitude that we should have for God and what he brings to us. So as you give today, an offering, just keep that in your mind, keep that in your heart. And so if you'll pray with me, please. Almighty God, we come to you today thankful for a God who is benevolent and gracious and nurturing and sustaining. As we give with a generous heart our tithes, our offerings, our gifts, please let them be glorified by you, magnified by you, and that we, in turn, glorify your holy name through the ministries of this church. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's turn her. Turn her. Go down there. Go down there. Send him down there. Come here, Ben. Ben. Are you going to take him? Let us stand, please.
before Catherine plays, I want to say something just real quick. Um, in the back, Savannah, who we prayed for to have her baby, she's home. She's healthy. She's back there. She has the baby with her. But I'm going to ask that with all the little ones like that, let's not try to take them from people because with all the viruses and illnesses going around, we just don't need to make little babies sick because that's really hard on them and mama. So I just, I know most of you know that, but I just feel like it needs to be said. So thank you. I don't normally talk, but I feel like I need to explain my thought process when Jennifer asked me to play. It was Monday, so I, I was in a different kind of mood, so I thought outside the box. Um, I told her I was not going to do Christmas, but I'm, I'm probably going to weave some in for the children, especially for the brand new baby. Miss Nicole gave me the baby Jesus two weeks ago. I didn't quite know what to do with that, so I took it home, put it on the tree. Um, and walked by it many times, back and forth. It's right by my piano. And, and the adjective that kept coming to me was sweetness. The baby is sweet, and it's so wonderful that we have the new baby here. Just pure, 100,000% sweetness as a newborn helpless infant. Miss Dawn read a couple of weeks ago all the lineage through which Jesus was promised to come. But as in the Bible study that we had with, with the pastor, Jesus was always here. He was the word. Through him, everything was made from the Alpha and the Omega. So that word came, entered this world as a helpless, sweet infant. But that one was also through which all creation came to be. So the second adjective that went with sweetness was majesty. I don't care if you look at the cosmos, the sky, or like myself studied cellular biology and looked at the, the composition, the DNA even of atoms, the majesty is the other adjective that came to my mind. So I have two adjectives to work with. I did all this in 20 minutes. <laughs> and I texted you back, didn't I? And in 20 minutes, so I have my libraries all spread out, you know, throughout the house with music and hymn books and, of course, my classical literature. So I, I went on a search for majesty and sweetness. And lo and behold, in the white book on page 144 is that hymn, Majestic Sweetness, which I doubt any of you know. So I thought, that's not Christmas. I was not wanting to do Christmas. There's a lot of Christmas already going on. So I'm doing Majestic Sweetness. And I had fun with this, but I am going to identify more, interweave more sweetness at the end. I hope you find and enjoy both concepts.
Amen. Amen. Chris, were you planning on reading liturgy today, or you want me to do it for you? We have it, we have it on here if you want to read. If you don't, I'll do it for you. You got, you got taken away by the beautiful music. No, I got more than taken away than that. Yeah, right? That was amazing. Jerry Gammon, where are you? It's my usually, usually my uh, ready backup. Let us pray. Father, prepare our hearts, our ears, and our minds for the uh, wonder of your Christmas message contained in your scriptures and gospels. Amen. Amen. From the 31st chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 10. Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams will water with wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool, and springs of water will satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. And a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the Highway of Holiness. Evil-minded people will never, never travel on it. It will be only for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any other ferocious beast. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. From the first chapter of the book of Matthew, verses 18 through 25, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Thank you. Let me get out of the way.
the door to go to children's church. We may have to make a new rule that the children aren't allowed to sing at the song right before the sermon. They can sing one of the other songs. Just saying. The only thing that saved me was Ben Brown and his head shaking. Ben Ban. Yeah, ben, I, I have a good friend named Ben Brown. Ben Bass, it got me giggle, it got me tickled, which kept me from ugly crying, which was a good thing. Will you pray with me and for me, please, as we enter a time of hearing the word from God? Almighty God, we come with busy hearts, uh, chaotic minds, um, tired bodies, and so many other emotions, I'm sure. But Lord, I pray that uh, you give us the strength and the courage to just lay that down at your feet and allow us to truly hear from you today. Let it shape us and mold us and change us. Let us hear what it is you need to hear. Lord, tuck me so far behind the cross of Christ that everything that comes from my mouth is filtered through that very cross as we hear this message. May the words of our mouth, my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable to you on this day and always. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So since I've been teaching a little bit about what Advent and the history of Advent and some of that kind of stuff, I've had people ask me more questions. So I'll give you a new tidbit of information today. Um, today is Gaudete Sunday. So take that to the bank. Uh, Gaudete means Joyful Sunday. And for those churches that um, kind of like the purple, purple, pink, purple candles, which is what we've been teaching the kids in, in, uh, on Wednesday nights, I believe, maybe Sunday school, I'm not sure. I, I got schooled by Kellen and was told that our candles were wrong. They should be purple, purple, pink, purple. Um, and I, I explained to him that there's a lot of different colors, and I'll explain that later. But anyway, the pink candle is for Gaudete Sunday, the Sunday of joy. Um, and just a reminder, if you go searching through your Bible, you are not going to find the practice of Advent. It's not in there. Um, it came about about 300 years after the ascension of Christ. The church decided that the secular overshadowing of holidays was taking over the season leading up to Epiphany. Epiphany was the big deal then. Because Epiphany was God's manifestation of the, the Messiah for the people. We, we picked Christmas Day and put it in there once again due to the secular overshadowing of other things, which we kind of still have that problem, don't we? But here's the thing. For those of you that go, well, if it's in the Bible, well, not in the Bible, it's of the Bible. All the things, all the concepts, all the ideas, all the observations that we look towards during the season of Advent, the entire process of the 29 days comes straight from the Bible. Journeying with God, looking for a God who comes to us, observing the birth of the Messiah, listening to the words of the prophets, waiting for that baby Jesus to bring us new life and looking forward to the Christ to return. All of that is of scripture. So we truly um, find Advent within scripture, just not what we do today. And it's when we prepare to wait for a God who comes to us. And it's important to note that God comes in the past, the present, and the future. In the past, we hear God coming through miracles, but also the words of the prophets, which were God's words spoken by his chosen people to give us wisdom and warning and hope. And in the future, as we await the return of Christ, but in the present, there's the present for the people of Israel at the time, and then there's the present for us today that God comes to us at Advent. And so this week in Advent, we shift to more of a feeling of joy. 
you know, it's kind of been almost a little like Lent leaning up here. We've had a lot of repentance, a lot of wait, a lot of prepare, and now we're going into joy. But as we learned Wednesday night, um, it's not joy based in human emotion or human happiness. It's joy based in God. And that Greek word joy is kara, C-H-A-R-A, which comes from the word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, and the word charis means grace. So it's joy, joy born out of the grace of God. It's joy born from a God who comes to us as we need. So why blue candles? Now I'm going to be honest, I was tickled when I came to this church and found out that they had blue candles. My first year, um, the only baby that we had going at that time that would have been baby Jesus was Ben Bass. He had just been born and he was itty bitty tiny. And look now. And we had blue candles and I was tickled. And I even went to a friend of mine who makes stoles and said, I want an Advent stole that's blue. Now I don't have a problem with purple. Purple and pink happen to be two of my favorite colors, but um, I've always loved the idea of blue for Advent and the meaning behind the blue candles rather than the purple, which means royalty, and the pink that means joy is, first of all, it's just another choice. Some churches use red candles for the blood of Christ, but we use blue, and it's nice because it gives you a shift and a distinguishing mark away from Lent. It's different. Now, one reason why I always like blue, and I didn't know this was a thing until I actually read last night, you know, reading is good. Um, I always thought that it was nice to have the darkness because the people wandered in the darkness until Jesus sent the light of Christ, the light of the star, the light of the angels in the sky that pierced through the darkness. I've always loved what goes on in my head when I read that and come to find out that's why they chose blue. So we have blue. And I'm excited for that. And we'll save, ah, my, ma my mic is being weird. We'll save purple for Lent and, and this year as we lead up to Easter. Now let's go back to that past, present, future idea of um, Advent. Of course, the past is the prophets. And Chris read to you from Isaiah 35, which was a beautiful picture, wasn't it? Like a, a beautiful place with animals that were kind and nobody, no violence, no fear. Um, God's coming to meet you and save you. And, and there was this highway called holiness that only non-fools and righteous people could walk on. Bad people couldn't even get on this highway. And it, and it was beautiful. Now, but the thing is, remember the prophetic formula? First, there's a warning. And if you don't pay attention to the warning, then there's judgment, which I prefer to call consequences of your bad actions. And then comes the hope. And this is the hope. So if, if you want, uh, for fun, to go home, you can read chapter 34, which is where you finally see the judgment of God in the book of Isaiah. Keep that in mind, chapter 34. He warned them for 33 chapters. And they still didn't get it. And the warning was bad. He was going to take away their kingdom and it was going to be wilderness and ugly and dangerous and hard and rough. And really God didn't take it away. It was their own doing because they would not turn to God. But he has the prophet Isaiah deliver a message to them that says, but this is available. It's here. And if you can get on that road, that highway of holiness, you will obtain this beautiful hope because I'm going to meet you on that highway. I'm going to come and find you on that highway. And we, I love where it says in chapter three, I mean, in verse three, it says, with this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. So he's speaking to the people who didn't turn away from God, who are able to get on this righteous highway, but he's saying, help those that their weak mindedness and their tiredness has allowed them to continue to turn from God. Strengthen them, encourage them, bring them along. And then it says in verse four, say to those with fearful hearts that are afraid of everything around them in this bad place of judgment, be strong and do not fear for God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And what we know is that salvation comes when God meets us on the highway of holiness in the birth of Christ. And we see in that 
passage that Chris read from the book of Matthew, um, it's a much shorter version than what we get in Luke. Much, much shorter. It's like um, seven or eight verses. Very short. But that's for a reason. Matthew was writing 70 years after Christ's death and ascension. Um, He was writing to Jews. One, to remind those that had already decided to follow Christ that this Christ you follow is the Messiah we always heard about. And also writing to the Jews who had not yet made that decision, had not yet come to that realization, to once again to encourage them to consider that this is the Messiah you heard about forever. And so he didn't need to tell them the depth and the breadth of the story. He just needed to connect the dots for them again. And that's what he does. And then he tells them about this highway of holiness. Now, and God will meet you on that highway of holiness, of righteousness. And we see that as he meets them with the birth of Jesus. Um, Yeshua is his Hebrew name, which means the Lord that saves. And that's who Jesus is, right? The Lord who saves. I may have to just hold it. My ear is defective and it doesn't do with glasses in my weird ears. So what we see, mm, that didn't work. So what we see is if we look quickly at the future of God, it's just waiting for Christ to return. But let's talk about the present for us for now because I think that's important because that's what Advent's all about. I challenged you to not let Advent be reduced to four Sundays, but to look at it as 29 days and each day find place and space to truly lean in to God and to truly lean in to a God that we can see. Here, I'll let you do the work while I keep talking. We've had to do this before. Jamie's amazing. So anyway, for us, Let's try this, friends. I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, I have a defective ear. Ears. They're probably both. My mom told me they never worked, so I don't know if this is what she was talking about, but we'll let Jamie adjust that. But some of you may go, well, how did Mary and Joseph get on that highway? Because we get on that highway when we get baptized and we make a commitment to God through the water and the spirit that we're going to have this new life of transformation. So how did Mary and Joseph do that? Because they didn't have that. They didn't have baptism. How did that, how did that work? Well, first of all, Mary was chosen by God. She was told she was favored, which was grace that brought her to this level of holiness. So Mary gets to get on the highway. But what about Joseph? What about Joseph? Joseph showed his righteousness before he ever saw the angel. And I'm going to tell you how. I think Joseph gets kind of shoved down the list of cast of characters to almost an extra. He, He doesn't get, I don't believe, some of the respect for what he's done in God that he deserves. But if you think about this, and we've talked about this before, she found out she's pregnant. She goes to him. She tells him she's pregnant. Oh, by the way, it's the Holy Spirit. There's that. And then on top of that, he's been in a committed relationship with her where they have not been allowed to be alone, ever. His family or himself has already paid her parents a significant amount of money as a bride price. And if she's pregnant by someone else, which he knows it's got to be someone else because he knows it's not him, then she's committed adultery. And he has a choice to make. He can either choose to go ahead and marry her, which was not his first choice if you remember scripture, but if he had chose to marry her, it would have destroyed his reputation. Because 
everyone would assume that they had had intimacy beyond marriage too early. And it would have been a problem because there are rabbis who check those things on a woman right before she marries. Weird, I know, but they do. They did. And then, in addition to that, he could have chosen to divorce her quietly, which what we see in scripture was his first choice, to divorce her quietly. But what that means is, one, he didn't get the bride price back. So he's out this money, which it was a significant amount. And in a time when nobody had a significant amount of any money, and in addition to that, reputation still ruined. Because either he got her pregnant and left her, or he was with a woman who was busy. Wasn't good either way. Now his next choice, which would have saved his money and his reputation, would have been to take her before a judge and declare that she had been adulterous and had slept outside their bonds of commitment. And he would have gotten his bride price back and he would have gotten his reputation because he was an innocent bystander to all this. But the cost of adultery at this time was a sentence of death. They didn't always carry it out, but often did. And that was, a, that was a danger. So this man made a choice that would at least keep her alive. It would hurt his reputation. It would hurt his pocketbook. But it would allow her to live until the angel came. And then when the angel came, he married her, which still damaged his reputation. But it also says in Scripture he did not have relations with her, which was what you did on your honeymoon night to consummate the marriage from a betrothal to a marriage because he knew scriptures from the prophets that said a baby would be born to a virgin. This is a righteous man, y'all. And those two young people that quickly became outcast of their own people headed down the highway of holiness to provide us with a meeting with God through Jesus Christ on our own journey on that highway. And we walk that highway. We walk, and as we wait for the Lord to come to us and walk with us. Now, because I love you, I did not include one of the other lectionary scriptures this week from the book of James, which was, when you're waiting for the Lord to come to you, pray with patience. I'm just going to leave that there. I'm not going to go further with that. None of us wants to hear about that today. But just know it's there. But we have to walk. And we have to walk with intention. We have to walk with God as we find God in our midst. We have to move forward. Now, once upon a time, and I know it's hard to believe by looking at me now and knowing what my knees do and don't do, I used to run. A lot. Now, I never completed a half marathon or a marathon, but I used to get up, believe it or not, every morning at 4 a.m. Because in Oklahoma, if you don't run at 4 a.m., you will die of heat stroke. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. Get up at 4 a.m. and run. And I didn't even know how far we ran. I ran with a friend, and she wore a headlamp, and I literally held on to her shirt and kept my eyes closed and just ran. Because you couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. Found out later we were running six or seven miles. I didn't know. Probably a good thing I didn't know because I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have made it. I didn't really like to run. Um, it was not my favorite thing, but the endorphins at the end are great. And not only that, and the, you know, you could eat a little more because that's great because you're burning a lot of calories. But the other thing was I was trying diligently and vigilantly to get pregnant in my marriage, and I couldn't. And the doctor was starting to say things like, I don't know if this is going to happen. And so I needed a distraction, honestly. So Tulsa decided to have a marathon, and along with that, they decided to have a half marathon. And my friend and I knew we could not run a marathon. We were not prepared. And there wasn't enough time to train, but we were pretty sure we might be able to make a half marathon. So we went out to the lake, and we put mile markers um, beyond 5K because we were having a big 5K there. So we already had those. So we, we took it all the way to 13.1 miles, which is a half marathon. And I went out and I would run. And what I found was I would perseverate on the next mile marker. Like the minute I hit the first mile, I would start watching for the second mile. 
And the minute I would find the second mile, I would start seeking the third mile. And then when I hit the third mile, I'd start praying for the fourth mile. And then I would never make it much further than that. And I'm like, but we're running at 4 a.m. six or seven miles. What is my problem? We couldn't run this rate, this track that early because it was around a lake and we would have ended up in the middle of the lake wet. So I went home and I had to pray about it and think about it. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? And then I realized I was running for the wrong views. I was running to tab off my miles. But when I was able to run far, I had no clue how far I was running. And so I set out to run again, and I began to look for things aside from distance. I got to see bullfrogs, many of them as you'd run past, leap into the edge of the lake. I got to watch the turtles who were out on the stones further out, sunning, duck their heads in real quick. I got to see birds skitter along the lake. I got to see deer. I got to see so many wonderful things. And when I forgot about seeking my accomplishments or my progress, I made it 10 and a half miles the next time. It could be done. And so I knew we would get to run the race. And I was excited and I kept running. And it was all because I quit trying to look at where I was going, uh, what I was doing and how far and accomplishments and began to let God be shown to me in this time. I began to see, able to see God in my, my mist, in my run, in my day, in other places. And that's what worked. And you want to know what? I never got to run in that run. Uh, doctor wouldn't let me because guess what? I got pregnant with Jill. So I didn't get to run. But that was okay. I didn't run anymore after that. And that's okay too, except after children. That's all right, found other things. But when we walk this journey, we start out by committing to the journey, and we do that through baptism. We do that when we say yes to God through the power of the Holy Spirit and the water that we will be transformed. And then we get become intentional by walking this path, sometimes through spiritual disciplines like prayer, scripture, coming to worship, Bible studies, communicating with God, trying to build the secondary relationship with Jesus beyond the one that's up here. And we get to where Jesus guides us. And then we begin to look with our eyes intently for these places and spaces where God comes to us in our everyday life. And we might see it in where God has come to someone else, or we might see it where God comes to us. But we won't see it if we're not looking. And we won't see it if we try to make it happen. And we won't see it if we wonder how long it's going to last and we get wrapped up in worry. This Wednesday, last Wednesday, we're doing a Bible study on Wednesday called Hope, and it's by Olu Brown. And he was talking about when the angels came to the shepherds, and they were afraid at first, but then they kind of relaxed. <clears throat> but it talks about that was a miracle. And how many times when we're living in every moment of our life a God moment, do we miss miracles because we're not looking for them? And then if we do see a miracle, we're so worried about how did that happen? Or what do I need to do to make it last longer? Or what do I need to do to make it happen again? Instead of just sitting back and enjoying the miracle. That's your task for this week. Is to sit back and look for miracles and then enjoy them when they come. Don't worry about how it happened. Don't worry about what you need to do to get to that joy. Don't worry about manufacturing miracles. Just let them happen. God's bringing them to you on this highway to holiness. And you just need to sit back and let God reveal himself to you. And then you find that joy, that joy that is from God's grace directly and love that is wrapped around you. And then God will begin to walk that path with you on that highway to holiness till that day when we all get to that beautiful place Chris described when he read the book of Isaiah. But it doesn't happen if you don't first get on the highway. And some people don't want on the highway because they know they're going to change. But some people are smart enough just like the kiddos saying, I am redeemed. It's all gone. And they know they can step right on that highway. But it takes intentionality once you get there so you don't divert off. 
It takes you turning Advent into 29 days and then the days after that into days that matter. It takes actually paying attention. And if you've not been baptized, or maybe you were, but it was when you were a baby and then you never got to confirm that decision that was made for you or whatever, you know, maybe now's the time to start praying about that so that you can make that step and take that way, that path, that highway to holiness. Because that's where we're supposed to be and that's where we'll meet God. So Catherine's going to play for us. And during this time, this altar is welcoming you. It's not just open. It's welcoming you to come and pray at the feet of Jesus. It's welcoming you to come pray for someone else. It's welcoming you to maybe come find a miracle or hear something that you need to hear. And if not, please, in your seats, remain meditative so other people can have this moment. From generation to generation, there's a God that comes to us over and over, a God of salvation, a God of love, a God of power, a God of might. May this be the week that God comes to you in a mighty way and something in your life is better. Have a blessed and holy week. Don't forget to come tonight and there's a love offering for the nursing home.